Let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for being here today for this uh, session on education. My name is Cecilia Sorensen. I am an emergency physician, and I am a climate and health science policy fellow with the National Institutes of Environmental Health Science and the University of Colorado. And I've been working with the Medical Society Consortium on educational initiatives for the past year. So I'm really excited to present an amazing lineup of speakers today who are going to share with us their experience and perspectives on climate and health education within academia, within public societies, within government, grade schools, and more. So. I want to start off by calling attention to the fact that the Medical Society Consortium represents over 20 different medical societies and over 500,000 different clinicians. And so because of this, we have a huge opportunity to amplify the voice of the medical community to protect our patients and to protect our planet. The way I see it is that education is really one of our main vehicles for change. When we talk about uh, transitioning over to a low carbon economy. How do we start these changes? And I think a lot of this starts with education on so many different levels. And everyone here today, because of the fact that you're here, plays a vital role in this process and has something to contribute. So as you're listening, I want you to try to think about how we as a community can connect and to collaborate to strengthen our approach. And I look forward to a lively discussion afterwards. So our first speaker today is Lois Wessel. Ms. Wessel is a family nurse practitioner with the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment and a member of the Alliance for Nurses for Healthy Environments. She is a practicing clinician at Community Clinic and Celebramos La Vida, a cervical and breast cancer screening clinic for Latinas. She is also an instructor in the Family Nurse Practitioner Program at Georgetown University. Um, can I just say a quick show of hands of who here works in educating the next generation of healthcare providers? So, more than half the room. And those of you who didn't raise your hand, we all do some kind of education in, in some form or another. Let me just make sure I know what I'm, oh good, okay, I can change the slides. Um, so I, like most of us, being a, um, a clinician, an educator, a human being, a, a parent, um, wear many hats. Um, and one of the hats I'm wearing today is with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Um, Annie, as we call it, has a table in one of the corners in there, so you can find out more about Annie. And in fact, our executive director is here. Um, and I know that this is a conference with a lot of different um, health professionals, including many physicians. And I think one of the take-home messages this morning was, um, it's not about Democrats or Republicans, it's about all of us working together. Um, and so this is the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, but uh, a, a working health system is a, is a team-based system where we all work together. So we have many resources that some of the physician educators may be interested in, and they're all free and on our website, and I'll talk about some of those. So the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments has a mission, promotes healthy people and healthy environments by educating the nursing profession and other professionals um, through research, advocacy, looking at the evidence. Um, and I think one of the other things that came out this morning that was interesting to me is that we can't look at environmental health and environmental health education for students um, in a silo. Like here's your class on pediatrics and here's your class on on maternal child health and here's your class on environmental health because we know that there are so many environmental things that affect women and children. It should be interspersed in the um, in all of the curriculum. And I think you know having people like Cece who's an emergency room physician who sees when there's bad air days she gets more kids in the ER with acute exacerbations of asthma means that it's not just a primary care prevention issue but it's something that we're all dealing with. Um, so to that extent, we have an education work group, and I'll talk a little bit about that because that's where we try to give tools to educators to do this kind of education. A research work group, which is really anything goes, any research that anybody's working on, we can kind of um, bounce ideas off each other. Um, a practice work group, um, which looks into how to have greener um, practices. There's also some information in the, in the exhibits um, and something we've those of us on the panel were just talking about here today, like how do we go to a conference and be greener and have less to throw away? And when you multiply that by a health system or a hospital system, there's a federally qualified health center in, in Washington, D.C. that has a green roof. And during the good weather, the patients can, um, can go up to the roof and pick herbs that then they talk about with their provider. So those are little things that we talk about that could make a big difference in healthcare. I know I'm excited at Georgetown where I teach 
um, we're getting another bike share station, so I don't have to drive my car to work and pay $25 a day to park, but there'll be more places for me to take the metro and then bike. And those are the kind of things we look at, how to have greener health care facilities. Um, a policy work group, and I know many of us here are going to be working on policy issues um, tomorrow on the, on the Hill, um, as well as specific things to look at climate change, safer chemicals, food sustainability, and, um, and energy and health. Um, and just a little background, in 2008, there were a bunch of nurses who were at a four-day meeting to talk about how to integrate environmental health into um, nursing. And there were many different specialties, public health nurses, state nursing associations, nurse practitioners, <laughs> nurse midwives, uh, members of the um, Black and Hispanic Nurses Associations, and they realized there was nobody doing work specifically on environmental health and nursing, and that's when the Alliance of Nurses um, for Healthy Environments um, was born. And many of these um, work groups ha have um, monthly meetings that anybody can participate in. Once you've sort of signed up for free end work group, you'll get information about the calls, and you can um, you can. Um, come onto the call. And sometimes there'll just be an article that's really interesting. You just want to hear people talk about it. And you do get continuing education for some of those. Um, now, why nurses? Why nurses for healthy environments? Well, um, as much as I love and respect my physician um, friends and family and colleagues, nurses are the number one most trusted profession. Um, and um, we have a huge role to play in communities. Um, one of my friends and colleagues from Georgetown today was saying that she was the, uh, the head of the um, health department in Texas, and she had a doctorally prepared nurse who had some leadership skills that she got in her training that sometimes the physicians don't get. So there are many roles that nurses play um, in um, talking about the relationship between human health and the environments where we live, work, and play. And I think it's really important to talk about those environments where we live and work and play, because those are all the places where, where we are. Um, and again, this morning, people are talking about uh, refugees, um, environmental justice. If we live and work and play in areas that are bad for our health, um, things are going to be bad. I know we just got something from um, the school system where my daughter's in school that 16 water fountains have been found to have lead in them across the county. This is Montgomery County, Maryland, a very wealthy county, um, you know, home to NIH. And um, my daughter took it upon herself to write an article for the school newspaper about why lead was bad in this environment where many children are, are spending a great deal um, of their time. So the, the Alliance looks at taking all the evidence and figuring out how we can act now um, to, um, to make the changes that we all know that we need to survive. And I think one of the, the most important points in terms of educators and non-educators here that I wanted to point out is that we do have an e-textbook. Um, and for those of us who are old like me, I still like paper, I print out articles to read, I, my brain works better that way, but I'm trying to get with the program of being greener. Um, and the nice thing about this environmental, this e-textbook is one, it's free, you don't have to even pay to download it onto your Kindle from Amazon, and two, as different studies come out about the environment, we can continually update it. And the textbook um, won the um, American Journal of Nursing's Book of the War, a, a, Book of the Year Award in first place um, last year, and it has different sections on, uh, they're listed here, harmful environment exposures, vulnerable population, practice settings, sustainable communities, et cetera. Um, and so this is an excellent um, resource, and because it is an e-resource, it links to interviews, webinars, videos. So there are pieces in here for the educators that you could pull out for a classroom situation or even a small group with students, for people who precept medical students. You could find something particular to what you're doing and pull out a five-minute um, video that, um, that may be um, pertainable to, to the students um, you're working with. Um, and specifically on climate change, we did also put together the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, Climate Change, Health, and Nursing, a Call to Action. And um, uh, Katie Huffling, who's listed here as an editor, is, is in the other room. Actually, I think she may be on a panel right now. Um, but uh, we do have specific resources related to climate change, do provide continuing education, including to, for nurses who are at today's um, meeting. Um, and we took the... Um, um, uh, the ANA, the American Nurses Association, and the AACN, which is the American Association of 
credentialing of nursing schools or something like that. Um, they're essentials for baccalaureate education and professional nursing. And we looked at what our guiding organizations were saying students need to learn about environmental health. And we came up with recommendations and have curriculum guidelines guidelines for nursing programs, um, whether they're at the associate's degree level, where there still are programs. In fact, I think George Mason, where we are, may have an associate's degree in nursing. Um, bachelor's prepared nurses, master's nurses, and doctorally prepared nurses. So it helps educators figure out what is the information that they can easily insert um, into their curriculum that addresses um, issues related to environmental health across the lifespan from the fetus to the infant, the child, the adolescent, um, and to the, you know, up until um, old age to help prepare the next generation of nurses to um, create healthy environments and to advocate for, for, a, for a healthier environment. Um, so um, just some uh, additional resources. I think I mentioned the Journal Club. We have um, uh, environmental health info to, for your curricula. Uh, many opportunities for student nurses and student um, medical students to come work with us. In fact, I'm in a doctoral program in nursing, and I'm doing um, much of my work with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Um, many take action. Um, fact sheets that will tell you what to do, and sample op-eds. One of the things I think is really interesting is I live outside of Washington, D.C. There's great editorials in the Washington Post about climate change, but we need to be reaching the little people across the country or, um, you know, some uh, like the, the uh, physician from the World Health Organization who talked about his brother in Connecticut who's, you know, probably not reading the Washington Post, but has a little paper in Darien, Connecticut that, that he may be reading. So we look at um, ways to get op-eds out into local newspapers. In fact, I recently um, published one in a, in a local paper in Richmond. So this is just a summary of um, our, um, some of the access on our website. It's envi, envirn, as for environmental nurse, um, dot org. You can see it there, um, and I'd be happy to talk more about how to integrate information on environmental health into your curriculum and with your students um, during the informal discussion session. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jay Lemery. Uh, Dr. Lemery is a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and is chief of the section of wilderness and environmental medicine. He is a past president of the Wilderness Medical Society and a past term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He is also the associate director of the University of Colorado's Consortium on Climate Change and Health and the director of the Living Closer Foundation Fellowship in Climate and Health Science Policy. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, CC. CC, of course, is uh, our fellow at CU, so uh, thanks for that gracious introduction. I'll be in your evaluation later. Um, just make sure I. Okay, cool. So I just wanted to talk to you about my journey um, briefly to, to how uh, I got into climate and health education. I'm a clinician, I'm an emergency physician, and um, I, I, one, I think it's interesting because I got here through another uh, vehicle um, for medical education that's actually probably different than many of you have gotten to um, or have heard about before, and it's wilderness medicine. It's the art and science of taking care of people in remote and austere places. But it's a great um, vehicle in, for medical education because it gets students really practicing hands-on without technology, and um, it's a wonderful mechanism, again, to sort of get out and think about wellness um, outside of the incandescent pressures of a, of a bustling hospital or, or medical clinic. And that's what really drove me here. Um, you can see here, I got started at Cornell. I was on faculty there for eight years, and these are some of the places we would go. Obviously, um, uh, the, a healthy wilderness was very um, important to, um, to teaching this curriculum in the classroom. And then from that, I started in 2004, and around 2007, 2008, began to think, why aren't we talking more about environmental wellness in these classes? And that's where I sort of began to think about um, uh, climate change and health and the, the conspicuous absence of uh, clinicians. I went to, we had kids, if you remember Cornell's med schools in Manhattan, 
So as soon as that happened, it was time to, to leave New York, although we loved it. Moved to Colorado, got a job in Denver. And uh, shortly thereafter, I began doing some wilderness uh, medicine with the U.S. Antarctic program. I was the EMS medical director, and then we switched poles, and, and now the medical director for the NSF's uh, science um, projects in the circumpolar north. So again, they are supporting the science, really touching a lot of the... Uh, the researchers in the polar regions and, and their stories, and it really saw, all started to, to come home. And it was really an essay from my mentor in JAMA in 2008 that kind of hit home for me. It was called Physicians in the Environment, very elegant, straightforward, two-pager on why, on the case for being involved, uh, why, why physicians should be paying attention to uh, climate change and environmental degradation. I followed suit with my own editorial in a smaller journal, Wilderness and Environmental Medicine, and I love seeing some gray hairs out here because I talk about Dr. Strangelove to the med students, and they all are like, who's that? Was, do we have him? Was he was here professor last year? Um, and I wrote about Dr. Strangelove. And um, really, I made the analogy to say, look, we in healthcare have been here before a scary, existential, politicized um, force that none of us feel particularly, no individual feels particularly well empowered to tackle. Um, we've done this before, and it was in the early 80s when nuclear wars, we deviated from the detente of the 70s and 60s and 70s, and it became winnable, right? And that was when uh, healthcare providers from both sides of the Iron Curtain got together and said, uh, nuclear war is the final epidemic with no meaningful cure. And of course, that was the IPPNW, and they won the Nobel Peace Prize for it. <clears throat> so there was, a, there was an analogous path um, to suggest that there's, there's some fulcrums here we could be working on. Um, at CU, we started a con consortium on climate change and health. Um, it really uh, came out from the fact that we knew a couple things. One, in medicine, we knew, one, we were outgunned. We need more. It's a team sport. We need more people to help teach this. We also know it can't just come from emergency medicine. We need to bring in nephrologists, infectious disease, pediatricians basic science researchers, people that are doing research in the field, um, uh, environmental scientists from Boulder, you know, everyone getting public health, getting together and saying, hey, we have to tackle this, um, and that's how we're going to create more opportunities if we do go multidisciplinary. Um, this slide is probably the essence of what we're all talking about. Let's change it from, from the left to the right. Um, and, I, and bring it back home, right? Bring it back. I think uh, nursing is the most trusted profession. I think pharmacists are up there. Physicians, I think, are still up there. And again, love the crowd because everyone knows who this guy is. Some people do, right? <laughs> Marcus Welby, MD. Amazing, right? He had all the time in the world with his patients. There was no joint commission, right? He never got sued. All his diagnoses were right. He smoked, right? And yet we all loved him. Um, and that's, we still hold the public trust. And I think that's, uh, that's the real um, opportunity we're looking at. Get away from the altruistic, save the whales. I love whales, love Mother Earth, I love my mom. But still, this isn't quite what we're talking about, or the abstract, or obtuse, like 400 parts per million of, of carbon dioxide. That means nothing to most of the general public, although many of us here probably have that 400 tattooed on our, um, <laughs> on our visual cortex. And then change that narrative, right, to talk about our, our, our parents' risk of uh, chronic lung disease, our kids' risk of asthma, and to have uh, people, clinicians, who are really well versed to talk about the health impacts and to put it all together in a very tight, compelling narrative about what happened last summer in Puerto Rico, Houston, and California. Um, and so this was one of the challenges, and I got together again, you'll see this name one more time, Paul Auerbach, my mentor, and we say we have to do better. And so we wrote a book, this came out last November, and it's called Environmetics, <clears throat> and it was really taking this to the bedside. So um, you may roll your eyes at what I'm about to say, and I get it, but it, you know, the narrative goes something like this. It was the hottest day of the year in the South Bronx, and Sally just ran out of her inhaler. And it used to be only two weeks it was this hot, now it's a full eight weeks. You know, we kind of go into like the visceral response of what an asthma attack is like, because that's what we'll be seeing more of. We wanted to really bring that emergency medicine experience. When we thought about how we would teach this, um, we came up with a curriculum, and I teamed up with my um, uh, friend George Luber at the CDC, and we came up with a, a, a textbook, which we're now able to use. You know, it's basically a ready-made 
curriculum, um, oops, and some, I see some of the chapter authors here in the audience, but uh, basically a curriculum that can be taught in um, uh, public health schools, medical schools, as well as undergraduates. So when we thought about what our, our educational program looked like, we pretty much didn't feel like we were in a position to do K through 12, but almost anyone else was fair game. So we started a, uh, um, an elective at the Colorado School of Public Health, which we taught last year. Um, so that went over right, very well. Um, we have a School of Medicine undergrad course. We teamed up with uh, Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, ATOC. Frankly, we team up with anybody who will take us at this point. <laughs> um, but what we needed was a partner who was sympathetic, who got it, who could give undergraduate credit. Right? That's um, a limitation when you're at a graduate school, a School of Medicine or School of Public Health. You don't have that uh, built-in ability to give credit. <clears throat> so now we're teaching this in a combined wilderness medicine course, um, which you know people, uh, students pay for, so that's a way of sort of funding the other things that maybe aren't as uh, lucrative or won't get paid for. Uh, Cecilia has done a ton of work starting a uh, school of medicine elective next year, um, and we already have 25 registered already, so that's looking bright. We'll see how many drop. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then perhaps the biggest uh, thing that I think we could share our experiences, and happy to talk more about this, is that we found a sympathetic foundation to help underwrite a, a, a science and health climate, um, science and health, um, excuse, climate and health science policy, excuse me, fellowship for newly graduated physicians right out of residency. Um, by our own, um, where we were located, we, we based it in emergency medicine because that was just something that was easy for us to do because it could partially offset uh, Cecilia's salary with clinical shifts. But we think this, this uh, methodology would be readily replicatable to internal medicine, pediatrics, or any of the clinical services where the fellow had an opportunity to work cl uh, clinically to partially buy down their salary. <clears throat> um, Dr. John Balbus has been gracious with his time and input, and he's one of the co-fellowship directors at the NIH, as well as um, MOUs with the CDC and American Meteorological Society to have our fellows participate in their activities as well. Our goal was, um, if we have, um, if we declare it such and we have the right person and we give them the ability to get into the room, um, then it's just a matter of connectivity using our leverage to say, hey, let's get Cecilia to help out and um, get to know people. And again, you've done a great job with this meeting as well. So she's been a big part of the um, medical consortium um, on um, medical society consortium CME products. Um, so we can talk more about that too. <clears throat> Um, when we thought about the competencies look like, this is a long list, but I just want you to pay attention to the bold areas, and I can give this to anyone who's interested. There were six, six big competencies, and we just threw them out there understanding they would change over time. Knowledge of science foundations, knowledge of U.S. government and relevant state policies and institutions, knowledge of international institutions relevant to climate change and health, um, knowledge of health implications of climate change, and uh, climate change and health impact and vulnerability assessment skills. And finally, um, public and stakeholder engagement skills. We really wanted someone who was sharp, could perform well on the podium, was facile and nimble giving interviews and just basically knew how to put it all together, you know, when in, in these short media, you know, 20 second sound bites or, or, tw um, or tweets, et cetera. So that's a lot of what we talk about as well. Um, so finally, I think, you know, that we all sort of pulled this all together and we just wrote an editorial in the BMJ last, uh, last fall and it was introducing this concept of climatology medicine. I don't know if this is even a good idea to call it this, but it was meant to be a provocative piece to say, hey, let's just throw it out there and say, none of us are particularly well qualified based on the current training to pull off, uh, you know, to be a, a, a a climatologist, but together perhaps maybe there's some shared competencies we could look at. Um, and I think that was sort of the, the aspiration. Uh, understanding that healthcare providers are natural educators, respected science communicators, we come from a diverse background. Um, we in healthcare are very comfortable in that space of not having to prove everything because all day long we're doing our best, pulling the best science and making a treatment plan for that individual patient. Um, so I think there's a, there's a bit more facility with flexibility in that regard um, in translating abstract concepts into digestible treatment plans for our patients. 
<clears throat> we thought a cross-disciplinary approach was absolutely essential, where we have input and collaboration with medicine, environmental science, public health, basic science research, um, and all together coming up with this multidisciplinary field, collaboration, um, club, whatever you want to call it, but it, uh, it, basically it, it, something that, ha that uh, exemplifies nov novel skill sets and has a compelling narrative. <clears throat> because if not, um, the future, uh, this is just something we have to do to make sure that we're tackling the, these new challenges. So I'll stop there. It's got to be 10 minutes, right? <laughs> Sorry for that technical hold up. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Caroline Welbury. Dr. Welbury is a family physician and faculty member at Georgetown University School of Medicine within the Department of Family Medicine. Although she has many interests, she is currently going full throttle to address climate change in medical education. Her current co-authored articles include A Case for Climate Activism, But Where Are the Medical Students? And Many Possible Pathways, It's Time for Medical Schools to Introduce Climate Change into Their Curriculum. So I'm not to be confused with Mark as well B, even though my name is Wellberry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, did, I have some an introductory remarks that I'm sort of going to read, and then I will close my computer. Um, okay, can you, you can hear? Okay. Um, so, um, so I'm a professor of family medicine at Georgetown University, a school of medicine, and I teach both medical students and residents. Um, so I'm motivated by a long-standing awareness of climate change dating back to my teens. Uh, concern about climate change was evident even then, and I had numerous apocalyptic nightmares about sea level rise, warming temperatures, and other threats to the earth. So my motivation thus precedes my professional identity by a long shot. Um, but no, uh, but uh, no matter what I would be doing uh, now, to, I would be addressing climate change, whatever, whatever profession I was in. And I was very impressed by a <clears throat> talk given by the president of the World Bank, Jim King, Kim, uh, because he called for every sector to um, address this issue. And that really resonated with me. Uh, while I believe we make a reasonable argument um, that physicians should speak out against climate change uh, because it's bad for our health, I, I believe that dying and that a dying planet is bad for our health, and that's really the message that anyone can own. So we try to squeeze our health message into these uh, sort of given categories that uh, have, have relevance to our constituencies, um, vectors, cardiopulmonary disease, uh, heat stroke, and so forth, um, which is actually a problem which relates to the extreme specialization of our various learners environmental medicine, public health, clinical care, specialties within clinical care, all these fields have different skill sets, focal points, methodologies, and they aren't integrated. And you add to that the myriad manifestations of climate change, affecting <clears throat> ocean, sea level rise, biodiversity, air pollution, um, and um, so, you know, you, you have a difficulty trying to figure out how you can uh, address this issue from the perspective of your own area of specialization. But we have to remember that the root cause of climate change is fossil fuel extraction and combustion. It's self-fueled by consumption, that is, the sellers and buyers of fossil fuels. Um, that's what we must address. So even though I've introduced two medical education components into the curriculum, 
my thinking is continually evolving. Um, and it's evolving in, con in concert with that theme that energy is the problem. Um, so I'm going to describe what I've done so far, but I also want to emphasize that um, I am still heading in new directions, or at least where I think that we need to be going. So I've been teaching, um, I've been teaching undergraduates and residents, but now my focus is really medical students. Um, and so what I've, used, I've looked around and seen what can I do in medical education. First of all, I've been very involved in um, developing objectives with various groups, and now there's three sets of groups I've worked on creating objectives for medical education. Um, I also instituted a one and a half hour workshop for our first year learners, it's a required course, and also a required third year family medicine clerkship module, and all the students rotate through family medicine so they get that there. Um, I've developed an elective, but I haven't implemented yet because of many conflicting duties that I have, but um, it's, it's definitely um, something that I have, um, I have outlined. And we also have written a grant to develop a fellowship, maybe along the lines that Dr. Lemery had described. Um, so in this patient's policy and population policy course, these are the things that I cover basically, which is just introducing students to the idea of environmental health, all of which I've had to learn as I go along because I'm not an expert, as was pointed out, we aren't experts. And then trying to relate that to, to knowledge about climate change, and um, the meeting is starting now. Let's see, I get rid of that. Um, then the health effects of climate change, all of this in one and a half hours. Then problems with the beliefs about the reality and importance of climate change. And then what's hap what uh, clim climate change in medical education might mean. So I'm uh, covering a lot of ground and one of the problems is that that's the end of the first uh, the workshop and then the students go on to do their other things and so one of the problems is trying to figure out how to um, develop continuity. Then I have this third year clerkship module and I'll just show you some of the slides that I use but there I really try to focus on air pollution and how air pollution and climate change intersect. I have these objectives, I show them about the health effects of air pollution and how climate change and air pollution inter, interact and why, they are, why one and the other are interdependent, and then how this might have cardiovascular um, and also pulmonary effects. Then the students have breakout sessions where they answer these questions having to do with the mechanisms, the, um, the health effects, actually that comes before the slides that I showed, just showed you, um, and then about um, a little bit about health justice and who's most vulnerable to these effects. And then I have them look up the air quality in DC that particular day. In the last few months it's been very good so it's hard to make my point. Um, but then I also have them look at the air quality in Delhi and it's always bad there so that's very satisfying. <laughs> um, and then I ask them about what we would do in the clinic, what kinds of treatments or preventive measures can we offer. Um, and I asked them to look up the data, some information on face masks and, masks and, and also just the, um, how to use the air quality index in order to advise their patients. Um, so then uh, I also have a discussion then at the end where I ask the students, um, can and should we talk to our patients about uh, the respiratory effects of air pollution, which is really a public health and not an not a clinical issue, and then should we be t talking to our patients about climate change? And it is very interesting to see the tensions in the class in having this discussion because that really gets to the point of, you know, uh, is this something that is relevant to medicine, clinical medicine, and in what sense is it also a political issue? And it always comes up as a political issue, which is really strange and unfortunate that mm -hmm. that is our reality. So where do we go from here? Well, the theme that I mentioned at the beginning was that uh, our only solution is to use less energy and burn fewer fossil fuels. So 
how, uh, how does this apply to medical education? Well, you know, somewhat limited, but we have these competencies and requirements that we ask our medical students to adhere to and we need to get uh, accreditation agencies, uh, board exam uh, writers to integrate this and make this sort of much more of a, rea a required reality. Um, we should also think about how this could be brought into the uh, to patient care and as a, as a discussion. Um, and more importantly, we need to uh, start thinking more stringently about activism. So for the patient care example, um, there, I mean, there could be an example of using personal behaviors, students to think about their own, um, you know, their own ecological um, uh, consumption and then um, applying the, uh, this also to their patients and teaching them the co-benefits of healthy behaviors and um, healthy planetary behaviors. And this was the actually the, uh, the topic of our 2011 um, article for American Family Physician, which we are updating right now. But um, we, it was basically um, an article, a, c a cover article for AFP on the co-benefits of um, healthy behaviors and climate change. And we got more, we've got a record amount of hate mail oh, um, for that, uh, which is why it's been now eight years <laughs> since we were updating it. But now we're, um, bravery has taken over and we're gonna try it again. And it'll be interesting to see what the responses are this time. Um, then, of course, there is, I think, another way to galvanize students and make them more activist is to engage them in their, um, in their healthcare system. And here is that slide, Gunderson, <laughs> that I was uh, talking to um, uh, you about before. Um, and um, just trying to make, uh, give students a project and something to study that really is relevant to their particular environment. And then, uh, and then there is the whole idea of advocacy and activism. And there are, I mean, I think we're all trending in medical schools now toward a more socially conscious um, um, awareness in general about race and about uh, inequalities, et cetera. And um, I think we can build on that by bringing together all the activist groups and creating a kind of activist clinic where our students can learn to, activ uh, to advocate for a cause. And the reason I put this very lovely slide up there is because I learned that um, I should get rid of all my dark and pessimistic visions and create some, uh, and, and encourage people to envision something beautiful and futuristically, um, not uh, the opposite of, well, utopian, which is the opposite of dystopian. And I think, um, actually, when we heard that talk this morning about the fossil fuels and how we can re re uh, <coughs> reach 100% uh, green energy and everybody's very clean energy and we were very excited about that. It shows that having an optimistic view and something to work toward is, um, is desirable and maybe that we can use that as leverage to get our students uh, committed. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, so our next speaker is Brittany Shea. Uh, Ms. Shea is the project director for the Global Consortium, uh, sorry, for the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, hosted by the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Ms. Shea holds a master's degree in sustainability and environmental management from Harvard University, where she completed her master's thesis on water quality issues associated with hydrologic fracturing. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, which is being led by the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. And let's see. OK. Um, so as we've all heard a lot about today, the effects of climate change are already harming health around the world, and impacts will only intensify in the coming years. 
However, the climate and health field is still young with a modest number of experts, significant gaps in knowledge, and few developed educational programs or curricula in health profession schools. And the, the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education would like to help bridge this gap. Um, so our mission um, is to secure, secure commitments from all health profession schools around the world to educate their students on the health impacts of climate change and other planetary changes and to provide the curricular resources and guidance needed to implement those commitments. And our vision is that all health professionals around the globe will be trained to prevent, mitigate, and respond to the health impacts of climate change. So um, for the origins of the GCCHE, um, it was developed over the course of 2016 and formally launched in early 2017 uh, by the Mailman School. And it was born from a meeting at the 2015 21st Conference of Parties, or COP21, um, where the Mailman School partnered with the U.S. White House on a special session to highlight the need for greater investment in the study of and planning for the health impacts of climate change. And at this meeting, a pledge was signed and announced, uh, it was signed by 115 health profession schools globally to educate tomorrow's leaders on the health impacts of climate change. And the GCCHG will help health profession schools uh, implement this pledge. Uh, then in 2016, the dean of the Mailman School, Dean Freed, uh, presented at the WHO second uh, global co conference on climate and health on the GCCHG efforts. And the, um, the consortium also has its base at the Climate and Health Program at the Mailman School of Public Health and leverages the experience of that program. Um, it's the first academic program in climate and health in the U.S. And doctors uh, Jeff Shaman uh, there on the left and Dr. Knowlton, who's sitting here in front, um, are the academic leaders of the consortium. And we received startup funding, uh, startup support from the Rockefeller Foundation for our first year. So for the aims, um, we want to obtain those commitments from schools around the globe to educate students on the health impacts of climate change and share best practices. Um, and we want to develop the, the um, educational content. We want to develop the core knowledge on climate and health and model curricula. And then we want to build experts in the field of climate and health. Um, and we also want to support academic partnerships around the world, especially in under-resourced locations and countries. So for our structure, um, we have an advisory council, which is made up of high-level leaders in this field, a group of 15 people who serve as our global ambassadors and thought leaders. Um, and then we have a coordinating committee, which is a, which is a smaller group made up of eight people, and a few of them are here today and actually are on this panel, um, who are experts in climate resilience and training and who help us um, and advise on developing this educational content. And then, as I mentioned, we have our Mailman School team, which is made up of Dr. Shaman, Knowlton, and myself. So one of our big goals for our first year was to build up our membership, and we have 164 member schools and programs around the globe today, and uh, that's made up of public health schools, medicine, and nursing from 28 countries on six continents. And here's a quick look at our homepage, and um, you can visit the website, the, Website is gccag.mailman.columbia.edu and check out more of what we have posted up there at this point. So getting to the educational content development piece. Our goals are to educate all future health professionals on climate and health, to create a core set of knowledge, uh, provide curricular resources, and fill the knowledge gap. And our strategy for um, achieving these goals, our first two, um, our first goal was to survey our members, so to establish a baseline in the current state of climate and health education internationally and chart future progress. And, um, and then we wanted to gather as much information and ideas as we could from our advisory council and coordinating committee, plan the structure, the format, um, the disciplines needed, topics, 
key resources, audiences to reach, and core knowledge. And after we gathered all of this information and uh, planning, we were able to move forward in posting resources. Um, we just developed core competencies and um, we're now in the stage of providing additional content on the website and developing content. So here's a brief look at our survey. Um, we're currently analyzing results to share more broadly. And um, the survey asks questions about current climate and health and planetary health curricula, the type of education that the school offers, if it does offer anything, um, efforts to institute classes, partnerships with other institutions or organizations, um, and challenges that institutions have faced. We received 84 responses, so from about half of our members, and out of the 84 that responded, most, about 63%, already offer climate and health education, typically as a session as part of a required course or a standalone elective course. And most respondents are discussing adding climate health offerings, but have also encountered challenges in trying to institute the curriculum, such as lack of available st staff time and funding to support the development. And here's a look at our resources. Um, and the, we wanted this to be kind of a bulletin board of information for our members and other institutions that might visit the website. And so we have um, featured reports and articles up there. We have funding and award opportunities, job and internship opportunities, upcoming events, and um, a listing of some courses and educational resources. So um, again, I encourage you to check out the website and see more for yourself. And it's, we're continuing to update this page and add more resources. And um, these are our core competencies. So we recently announced a set of core climate and health competencies recommended for all health professionals. And I know we've, um, a few people have talked about their own competencies. Um, and it's been great to get input from many different people on, on um, developing this set. So um, it was developed over several months by our advisory council and our coordinating committee. Um, and the idea is for them to be adapted and implemented by the institutions. So the institutions know they have the best knowledge about what their own institutional needs are and for their program. And so we're hoping that they can use this set of core competencies and figure out how to adapt it to their nursing program or their medical program or public health. Um, and the idea is for them um, to identify climate and health core competencies for health professional students, and they reflect foundational climate and health understanding and skills across five areas of practice. And they are available on our website now. Um, you can also download a PDF of them. And uh, this is where we are right now. We're in the content delivery phase. And um, we're working on identifying and organizing content according to topic and then linking to the content on our website. Um, and we would also like to house content for members on the site, including slides, sample curricula, um, and uh, d you know, d syllabi. And um, we want to actually have this on the website instead of simply linking out to other institutions. And so right now we're actually working on the permissions for that with our legal team because there's a, a little bit of information that you need to work through in order to actually house the information on your own website. Um, so we're working through that right now. And then we would also like to develop uh, new content and fill in gaps that might exist. So massive open online courses on different topics, short videos, short courses, um, executive education, continuing ed, uh, board exam questions, and um, CME credits. Um, as Dr. Crawford mentioned this morning, it's important to continue to educate doctors so that they can help um, patients. And I know, Cecilia, you're working on that in that area as well. So, um, so that's it, and thank you so much for having me. This is a quick thank you to everyone that's been working with us over this past year. Thank you so much. Okay. 
So our next speaker is Dr. Lori Byron. Dr. Byron is currently a pediatric hospitalist and is a former student of energy policy at John Hopkins University. She's also a past president of the Montana Academy of Pediatrics, where she worked with the EPA and the American Academy of Pediatrics on environmental health committees. Additionally, Dr. Byron co-chairs the Citizens Climate Lobby Health Team. Thank you. I think this podium's about the size of a FEMA trailer. So we moved down in the trenches after our academic friends at the other weighted end of the table, and now we're in the trenches with Lisa and I. So thanks for having me here and for coming to this great event. I think we all had uh, different paths to enlightenment as it comes to climate change, and mine is one of a non-academician. Academician, yeah. So I'm sorry that we can't hear all the stories from all of you today because I know they're equally as important. My husband and I spent our entire careers on the Crow Indian Reservation in internal medicine and pediatrics, respectively. And there, while taking care of individual patients, we also looked at the big picture of public health and tried to improve community-wide problems like diabetes and car wrecks and other preventable conditions. We were also able to see disasters up front and what they did to a community and to individuals because we lived there and they were our families, our adopted families, and our friends. And whether it was mass vehicular tragedy or flood, we saw um, how the vulnerable are affected and suffer more than the general population. And we felt some of their pain. So, um, hmm, sorry. Um, so during that time, we were homeschooling our kids and we became totally immersed, uh, immersed in environmental science and experience. And uh, we began, became increasingly involved in the environmental movement. I think we actually sort of did every college course on environmental science with our kids while they were in high school. And basically, there sort of occurred a series of unfortunate, of fortunate events. So when the kids left home, we attended climate reality training. And then we came home and we had a colleague who started a chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby locally. And we joined up. And that's when we sort of, sort of first started seeing climate change as a public health problem. And I realized the things that were killing my patients were all worsened by climate change, whether it was diabetes or severe weather events, infectious disease, prematurity. Uh, and that sort of got us involved in the climate and health movement. We also began to uh, appreciate the respectful way that CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby, worked to affect change in Congress and that their plan was one of few that was really progressive, which means it helps the poor and lower income groups more. And we also began to realize that we could teach and talk and listen to everybody in America, but unless we moved our legislators, very little would happen. Uh, but this is kind of a chicken and an egg story, but please don't leave here saying that I'm comparing our legislators to chickens. But um, the, we know that uh, motivating our legislators doesn't work unless we activate the constituents to care and to contact their legislators. So um, around that time, we found that Citizens Climate Lobby wanted to start a health team, and so my husband and I ended up co-chairing this. And since then, over the past few years, um, our health team has grown to about a couple hundred people who are very active, many of you who are here today, and they do a lot of amazing things. They've been really involved getting uh, local and national medical societies on board, passing resolutions, giving presentations, and working with hospital systems. Since CCL also has about 80,000 volunteers who are not on the health team, we've been able to teach and edu educate with these activists about the health effects of climate. So as we spent more time in the climate change movement, we became more involved of, in other groups that were in our state that uh, believed things like we believed. And I'm sure there's a lot of organizations in your all's regions, because we don't have many people in Montana, so there's really not a lot of organizations. <laughs> we have made ourselves available to the environmental groups, and when they need testimony or a teleconference or a plaintiff in a lawsuit, whether it's about coal mines or coal trains or coal ash ponds, or radioactive fracking waste, or methane from fracking on public lands. They, uh, net metering and uh, some positive scenes, things too, they're always glad to have doctors testify. And many of these groups have also asked for information or presentations on health and climate. But we've also found opportunity at science rallies and fairs, at Earth Days and other tabling events, 
and uh, we have also used a creative puppet show mm -hmm. that where the dogs teach their humans about climate. Uh, you can Google dogs to the rescue. It was created by Wendy Ring, who's a physician and a climate activist. She started Climate 911, and we will be touring the state of Maine with her, with her puppet show this summer. So if you know any places in Maine we can give a show, let us know. And sort of like Walt Disney, we found that a presentation can be appealing to both kids and to grown-ups and inculcate both groups at the same time. So we've also worked a lot with the general public and we've learned a lot from George Mason and Yale on climate communication. And we found a lot of groups like to have speakers like the Rotarians and the Kiwanis and the Lions Clubs. But we've also had another group that I would like to mention and that's people of faith. According to the Pew Charitable Trust, people of faith are three to four times as likely to act on their concerns as are the general US public. And I don't know about you, but how many times you talk to a group and they're all enthused and they tell you they've learned all this stuff that they didn't know before, but if you really went back and looked a year later, most of them we haven't activated. So uh, if you motivate health groups, uh, church groups and give them some ideas and some concrete steps to pursue, they really are likely to do it. The major church organizations, actually almost all of them have very strong resolutions on climate change but rather like the medical societies, very few of their members are actually acting on it. But faith groups are already quite politically involved, at least for a lot of them. They're looking at death penalties and immigration and violence against women. Uh, so adding on climate change really does, does and will come natural to them. So Rob and I are working on a fledgling group in Montana that seeks to bring people of faith and science and medicine together under one umbrella in relation to climate change and we're planning a conference this fall and designing workshops that both emphasize the issues like health and environmental justice but also give them the practical tools to work with like political advocacy, instill, instilling, um, installing renewable energy, etc. So it's been helpful for this group to have doctors and scientists working with them. So climate change is a public health con condition. We all know that. That's why we're here. And when we look at how past public health conditions have been tackled, like smoking, um, it's never involved just doing the right thing yourself. So we all know that just driving a Prius and changing your light bulbs is not enough. Um, so something like smoking did involve talking to all the affected patients when we see them in our offices. It did involve passing legislation and finding harmful behaviors and forming passionate groups and forming coalitions with other NGOs. It did involve public health campaigns with public service announcements and billboards, and it involved talking to policymakers. So the bottom line is that we all can do something, and whether you have 15 minutes a week, which means you can call each of your uh, members of Congress once and leave a message and do it after hours if you're an introvert, or write a letter to the editor in your paper, um, or maybe you have more time than that and you can jump in full time like a lot of people in this room has done, have done. We are amongst the most trusted voices in America, and we all need to continue to leverage that voice for the greatest public health opportunity of the century. So thanks to everyone for what they're doing, and I hope we all get some ideas on how to do more. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lisa Del Buono. Dr. Del Buono is a surgical pathologist with expertise in GI and breast pathology who trained at the University of Michigan. After teaching pathology within the University of Michigan, she transitioned to the community and currently practices in a large hospital in northern Michigan. As a, concerned, as a concerned parent, she has volunteered with the Citizens Climate Lobby since 2013. She has served as chapter leader, an outreach coordinator, a mentor to high school students, and a liaison to her member of Congress. Thanks so much, Cece, and thanks for each of you here. I have to say that this has really been an exciting, uh, hope-inspiring, and a humbling experience because you guys are just doing amazing work. I am so excited to hear about the work that's being done to educate uh, health professionals. Um, it's so needed, so thanks to each of you. Um, I am a volunteer with a nonpartisan grassroots organization, Citizens Climate Lobby, and Lori nicely talked about uh, that 
public outreach we do, and I'm going to focus on educating our members of Congress. And as I go through the story, if you as health professionals find this interesting or are motivated to, to speak to your member of Congress, please talk to any one of us with CCL stuff on. Uh, we meet with our members of Congress many, many times a year, both in district and in D.C., and we'd love to have health professionals, those trusted messengers, with us to talk. So the question begins then, how does somebody who has spent most of my adult life sitting in an office, looking through a microscope and diagnosing disease, find herself uh, meeting regularly with members of Congress. Uh, you might recognize Dr. Jonathan Patz there. He came and spoke at one of our national meetings recently, a couple years back, and lobbied with us, and that's Senator Stabenow, and front and center is my son. And it really comes down to waking up to the fact that climate change is going to play out during our children's lifetime. And um, I was just uh, fortunate enough that when I woke up to that reality, that it was really going to play out through my son's lifetime and the fact that I as a parent couldn't turn away, there was a local chapter of CCL, the very first one, starting in Michigan in 2015. So I uh, volunteered. And it's a really interesting and wonderful organization because it gives the tools to average day citizens to engage with our democracy in a variety of ways. It's really not a one-size-fits-all type of advocacy. Instead, it encourages each of us to look within ourselves to find our best selves and take our unique talents to bring this, uh, this issue forward. And we're committed fiercely to engaging across the political divide. We focus on what we're for rather than what we're against. And we engage as generously as possible with everyone with whom we come in contact. Now, the first part of our mission statement is to create the political will for effective climate policy. And in order to do that, we have to educate ourselves. We have to educate each other. We have to educate the general public and we have to educate legislators. So I'm going to follow, focus on that last ex, uh, aspect. But as has been emphasized here, I just want to say that when I'm meeting with my members of Congress, I am completely convinced that we are, in fact, not only trusted mes messengers, but uniquely um, situated to be able to speak across party lines. So what is our message? Our message is what we've been hearing here, and thank you guys very much. Um, climate change is real. It's human caused. It is harming people today. But definitely, most importantly, there is something we can do about that. And emphasizing the fact that there is something we can do about that, whether I'm speaking publicly or whether I'm speaking uh, to my members of Congress, it's what allows, I think, the audience to hear what you're saying. If you don't end with, with options, then I think people have the tendency to tune out. I think also as health prof professionals, we have the added benefit of stressing what the co-benefits are of transitioning to the low carbon economy. And this is a message that can be heard to all people. Even people who don't want to say climate change is real, they do want clean air and clean water. Then we in Citizens Climate Lobby go the next step, and we uh, emphasize that by placing a steadily increasing fee on greenhouse gas emissions that starts low and goes high, we can actually catalyze that transition to the low carbon economy that we heard earlier today, we have the technology to do. We're creating that political will for that to happen. And then um, we have also know that placing this price on greenhouse gas emissions can actually much more efficiently draw down those greenhouse gas emissions than regulations do. Now, we too are very concerned about the most vulnerable among us. So our policy advocates that we take all those revenues and return them equitably back to American households. And 
What that does is it takes what would be a regressive tax that disproportionately would hurt the most vulnerable among us and makes it a progressive fee that actually results in people having more money in their pocket, especially if you're carbon virtuous. And the 2015 Lancet actually said that the single most powerful strategic instrument to inoculate human health against the risks of climate change would be to introduce strong and sustained carbon pricing pledged to strengthen over time. Now we recognize that there's a lot that needs to be done for climate change and we feel that a policy like this is just the best first step. It's equivalent to being in an overflowing bathtub and turning off the faucet. Now in preparation for the breakout here, CC went on to say, were there additional resources that would be helpful when we're reaching out to our legislators? And honestly, economics, money, speaks to our legislators. So it would be really great to have a clear, simple message that describes the data surrounding premature deaths, hospitalizations, health care dollars, and the direct impacts of burning fossil fuels, and what would be saved if we transitioned to a low carbon economy. The numbers vary greatly. It would be really nice to have it put in a way that's credible and easy to remember. And your personal stories, the stories that you guys who are clinicians have, uh, are, is another thing that greatly helps when we speak to members of Congress. Once this message is put together in terms that most people can understand, we in CCL have the ability then to get the message out across the country. And that's because CCL is organized according to voting districts. And we have chapters in almost every voting district in the US. We also have chapters abroad as well. In this way, the message can, can actually be amplified across the nation. And it is through this method, each of us working in our own districts throughout the country with a single and strong, respectful message, that we were able to encourage so many of our representatives to join the Climate Solutions Caucus, now 72 members strong. In closing, because so many of you are educators, I did want to tell you a little bit about the opportunity I had to mem mentor high school students over the last couple years. You know, as educators, we are un we're in a unique, we have a unique opportunity to uh, empower young people to engage in our democracy in an effective way that truly can result in meaningful change. And I can't underemphasize how powerful a young person's voice is. Just as we are trusted messengers, they too are trusted, and they're perceived as not having a hidden agenda. It is really their story to tell. So in ending, I'm gonna show a little video that I hope brings everybody hope as we close out. Um, and so the real question is, can we start the video? Are you guys gonna start it, or do I start it? Okay, we think we got it. I think we got it. This is where we live. Can you hear? A small town in northern Michigan called Traverse City. This is our congressman, first term Republican Jack Bergman. And this is the story of how we, a group of 14 high school students, oh, oh, I just Climate Solutions Caucus. The Climate Solutions Caucus is a group in the U.S. House of Representatives looking at policy hear? options to address our changing climate. Half of its members are Republicans and half are Democrats. The caucus exists in large part through the work of the Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm going to just see if I can get the volume up a little bit here. Well, I just zoomed everything. I'm oh, sorry, I'm trying to hit it. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, here we go, guys. We're almost ready. Now we just got to get it started again. Oh, no, I don't want that. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Is this it? No. Well, that was silly for me to stop. Do you know how to do it? Let me try. Right, it's right there. Okay. We might have to skip.
skip it. I'm so sorry. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, here we go. This is where we live, a small town in northern Michigan called Traverse City. This is our congressman, first-term Republican Jack Bergman. And this is the story of how we, a group of 14 high school students, persuaded him to join the Climate Solutions Caucus. The Climate Solutions Caucus is a group in the U.S. House of Representatives looking at policy options to address our changing climate. Half of its members are Republicans and half are Democrats. The caucus exists in large part through the work of the Citizens Climate Lobby, or CCL, a national nonprofit that trains citizen volunteers to advocate with elected representatives to take action on climate change. Our meeting with Congressman Bergman happened because of CCL. Here's the timeline of how we got there. In January, a group from our high school environmental club decided to make the trip to DC for the CCL June Conference and Lobby Day. In April, we held a fundraiser concert to raise money for the trip. We had music, food, and a silent auction. We raised enough to cover round trip travel and hotel costs. In June, we left Traverse City early in the morning and arrived in DC. During the two-day conference, we learned how to effectively lobby our members of Congress. Before we knew it, Lobby Day had arrived Tuesday morning, and we headed for Capitol Hill. We had three meetings, two with our senators, who were already on record supporting action on climate change. The big question was how our conversation with Congressman Bergman would go. The congressman welcomed us into his office. We started by thanking him for a specific vote he had taken to support the Great Lakes, then, one of our members told a personal story of how a change in climate has had an impact on her family. By being respectful and clear, we helped the congressman to be engaged. Then we made her ask, will you commit to joining the House Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus? He thought for just a minute and then said, I'll tell you what, yes, I'm going to make a commitment to you today to join the caucus. After some big thank yous, we went out into the hall to celebrate. <laughs> this is important. Representative Bergman is the co-president of the House freshman class, so his decision to join the caucus carries a lot of weight. More importantly, though, he is someone who is at one time outwardly skeptical about the role of humans in climate change. The fact that we, a group of ordinary high schoolers, could convince him to join the discussion on an issue that matters so much to us bodes well for the ability of young people to shape their democracy. It still feels surreal that he said yes, but one thing I know is that if we hadn't been there, there would have been no one for him to say yes to. We were there, though, and the caucus, now one Republican stronger, is one step closer to bringing about meaningful action on climate change. So, it was truly the best experience of my life, I have to tell you, working with these guys. And so, what you guys are doing here, reaching out, it's hugely important. And uh, thank you for your time. Big thanks to Lori and big thanks to all our speakers for being here today. It's so inspiring to hear about everything that you're doing and coming from so far and wide. And I know everyone sitting out here also has really great stories to tell. And what I'd like to do is uh, open up a discussion and hear um, both from the panel and from the audience. Um, I've got a question to get us started. And um, so our question is, so if we were to have, let's say, a Lancet countdown on climate and health professional education, what would, we, what would be our indicators? For example, I've heard a few people mention board questions. You know, we'll know we've achieved um, educating our professional students if we have questions on the boards about climate and health. But what other indicators should we be working towards and what steps do we need to take to get there? And this question is for the panel or anybody else in the audience who wants to take it. I'm happy to start on that. Um, in the nursing profession, in the different sort of categories of nursing, which is probably as confusing to those of you who are not nurses as it is to those of us who are nurses, um, there are certain competencies that must be met, um, as I would imagine are similar in the, in the medical profession. But not all of the competencies um, address environmental health and some of the things that we've talked about here today. Um, and so I guess a goal that I would like to see is that all of the different, and when I say different, kinds of ways you can be credentialed, so a medical surgical nurse or a nurse the anesthetist. Um, we, those of us in sort of more primary care professions have addressed those competencies in our professional organizations, um, like the American College of Nurse Midwives or the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, have 
started to look at these in terms of competencies to be able to graduate from programs. And therefore, if it is a competency, it does come on the boards mm -hmm. on the accrediting test. But I think some of the more tertiary based um, professions in nursing have not addressed it in the same way and it's not on their um, competency list and therefore not on their testing credentials. Gotcha. Uh, from the audience, yeah. Best in the panel, Jay. <clears throat> thanks, for, thanks for asking. Um, your question was uh, what, what competencies? I mean, or what indicators? What so indicators, rather? I mean, I think mm -hmm. you know, a very straightforward one is how many schools, how many professional schools are teaching, what percentage is that of the accredited schools, and then how many students are completing the completion and um, perhaps meeting a, a minimum standard of. Uh, of curriculum, and, you know, it could be a one-day intensive, or it could be one hour a week over a semester. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some sort of uh, equilibrator. So maybe something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And how important do you think it is that we all are teaching towards the same uh, curriculum objectives? For example, I don't think it's right now. I don't think it's that important. I think it's it's letting the energies and the specific uh, um, um, strengths. Of, the, of a of a school or a teaching program shine. I mm -hmm. think I think it gets wonky if this early in this these early days. If you try to regress towards a core competency for the diverse amount of learners, I think this group represents. Yeah, I think. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Bottles. No, I think one of the things that comes up is that we have um, you know experts who are embedded in different universities around the country, around the world. But there's also a lot of universities that have no. Um, no champion, no one there to really, to really lead these types of initiatives up. And so what do we do where we have these types of spaces? Something to think about. So inherent in your question about what's a good indicator is how do we get this done and how do we get it to be sustained? And um, you know, one thing that is the perennial lesson in trying to get environmental issues into any health curriculum is that, um, you know, Competencies and getting the competencies in there and the board questions is one. Continuing education credits is also very important. Um, but, but the foundation of it isn't surprising. It's money. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think an indicator should be, you know, we had the White House Summit. We had 127 deans signing on to something. Um, but there wasn't any money from the government behind it, and there isn't any money from the deans, for the most part, behind it. And so I think a really important indicator will be the number of deans who are putting some kind of institutional funding to the person who does this. Because unless there's institutional funding to the person who does this, and sustained institutional funding, you can't buy out the time, you won't have the person, you won't have the continuity. So yeah. that's an important indicator, too. Yeah, I agree with That's, uh, so we're trying to get on the, pro the scientific programming for all of our professional meetings. And from that, build a much broader um, base of knowledge of our colleagues. And from that, develop the um, kind of constituents that can have an impact on developing the core competencies, which then pressure to give time within medical institutions because we what we found, I think what you're implying is the medical schools all say there is no time for this because there's such a wide range of things that have to be taught. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I'm at the University of Illinois and another indicator would be 
the actual engagement of students, whether medical students or residents, in some activity that would reflect their knowledge of the connection between climate and health. I can just give you some examples. You know, we have uh, campus sustainability committees, and uh, the Student Senate approved fees for all students, including medical students, that go into a fund that's managed by a student committee. Well, you know, we got a medical student involved in you know, helping to direct that fund, right? Uh, we got another medical student involved in giving presentations with a member of the faculty at the medical student school to undergraduates and to public health students you know, on the health effects of climate. Then there are opportunities with organizations like Union of Concerned Scientists or there's an association of medical students. Um, and uh, finally, you know, there, the hospitals that they're training in have green committees, or they should have green committees. And getting the medical students and the residents involved in those, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, nurses as well, I, I don't know, what, you know in, in those activities, it really goes beyond just, you know, did you get a one hour lecture on mm -hmm. some climate and health effects? You know, it, once they get the lecture, you know, give them opportunities to take action, and then as an indicator of whether you're succeeding, how many students are taking actions? Yeah. Um, I'm Teddy Potter from the University of Minnesota, and we're really going for culture change versus competencies, mm -hmm. because we want to see climate change um, mitigation and adaptation to um, being everybody's everyday work. That it's something you're doing all the time in every field, everything that you're doing. We're also pulling the level lever of in interprofessionalism. Mm -hmm. so that whatever we're doing, we're mm -hmm. moving forward as interprofessionals working on these issues together. Mm -hmm. um, instead of top-down, we've um, really got around the issue of there's not enough time, not enough money, by having this be a student-led movement. We really worked with the students, did a massive survey in all our um, academic health centers, um, the students, to say, do you want this content? Once we had hundreds and hundreds of students saying, we want this content, that allowed us to go to the associate deans and say, yeah. look at our consumers, the people who are choosing our schools want this. Yeah. Suddenly the money and the time became available. And so then we developed climate change um, champions for all our schools and we're co-creating interprofessional content that's embedded in all of our schools for all of our students. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. There's a question oh. here and then there. So I, I want to just make two comments. Um, my name is Mona, I'm from the University of Arizona, um, and I'm really interested in this whole topic about indicators. Um, one of the things that I've learned um, just from talking to professors at the university, myself and other colleagues, um, when we're looking at indicators, um, Dr. Lembry mentioned, you know, is it one, one day a week, one day a month, you know, what is, what is that route of exposure and how much exposure is important? And I'll give you an example. For my university, my College of Public Health does not have a dedicated course on climate and health. Um, but does that mean that you know, the student body in the College of Public Health or at the university do not have any exposure? Um, and I learned through my just own research, no, um, they actually do. And that's through other programs like environmental sciences, like geography programs that host a lot of lectures and give you that sort of opportunity. So I think we cannot forget that element of exposure and what is sufficient exposure. Um, just to pick up on this gentleman's t uh, comment on engagement, um, again, for the public health workforce, I think we need to look at that whole uh, modality of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Um, for a public health professional entering into the field, you know, many of them are going into county and health departments and into leadership positions where um, if, let's say, you know, they have a knowledge, they need to be able to capitalize on that knowledge and be able to develop a need, conduct a needs assessment, inform um, the development of an adaptation plan for their agency. Um, I think that's another question that we as educators need to be able to answer is, you know, what level of knowledge is sufficient and how, how do we push that boundary into the skill level and the attitude level that they can carry into their professional lives. Yeah, great. Thank you. I, I had a question. I, I'm sorry if I missed the first part of this, but 
Going in on the clinical end might be one efficient way. For example, in occupational medicine, heat-related injuries are huge, going to be huge now, going to be huge in the future. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that Ahmed has questions on their board, correct me if I'm wrong, about heat-related injuries. Um, PrevMed does, I think pulmonary does, and I think allergy and immunology does. Mm -hmm. Is that not a legitimate way to sort of build support to get it in lower in the curriculum, in the medical school, in the MPH programs? Um, that's my question. Would that work? Does anybody want to respond to that on the panel? I mean, I think the answer is multifactorial. I mean, you know, there's, I, I think somebody developed this idea that for, for a tipping point to happen, you have to have a certain percentage of the population that buys into the change, and some people put it at like 3%, so you don't really need a lot of people. But on the one hand, you have to have the administrators buy in, you have to have the students driving the change, you have to have money, you have to have some kind of curricular um, embodiment you know, with exams that require that you know this, but you know, not any single thing, I think, is going to make the difference. You, um, but you do need enough people to be, you know, I, I would like to have, to hire agents of change that will walk the halls and stop people and talk about how important climate change is, and then eventually people will say, wow, there are a lot of people talking about how important climate change is. I guess it must be important. I think I'll go and do that too. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think these, we really should be psychologically savvy and work on issues of contagion and, <laughs> and try to spread the virus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm curious if there's anyone in here in a medical society, including you that just asked the question, that has not either signed on to the consortium or does not have a resolution on climate change with whatever organization you're with. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> I could talk about two medical societies at the risk of being ostracized by them, but um, uh, emergency medicine is nowhere near this, um, which is crazy because it's where we claim to be the vulnerability and the disaster response physicians. I mean, a very small, niche society called the Wilderness Medical Society is likewise, which I would, in full disclosure, was past president, but when this opportunity came up, I was off the decision-making board. Um, has, again, uh, viewed this as a, uh, viewed uh, the climate change is a political issue, so it's just disheartening. So I, it's still very real, um, that, that whole issue. Yeah. Right. So is PM&R on, or, or occupational medicine, do they have a resolution? Found your job today. <laughs> okay, we got a question here. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'm, my name is Todd Sack. I'm a physician in Florida. I'm heartened by the conversation we're having with our peers, but I think we need to do more to train ourselves as health professionals to talk to the general public, because that's where we're going to find more power. Faith, faith, faith groups, and others. I speak to Rotary clubs and other civic <coughs> groups in Florida, largely Republican organizations, mm -hmm. and we have tremendous power as health professionals to be persuasive. And we need to do more to train our peers to do that and give them the courage to speak in public. Mm -hmm. And do you I, think I've had that experience too? I think I think we really resonate well. And you know, when I first started giving speaking to the public, when I wanted to just talk about health impacts, or no, no, just talk about impacts of climate change, uh, many eyes were rolled. But when I was going to speak about the health impacts of the climate with it, my MD after it. Um, suddenly, you know, the Rotaries wanted me, the Elk Club, you know, et cetera. Uh, so I, I do think. And just one small thing that I thought was really interesting was when I originally started my presentations, I would put in a lot of graphs and stuff, and then the League of Women Voters comes to me and says, Lisa, can you change it to pictures? Because people don't like graphs. And so I was used to educating or talking, you know, to professionals. but. Uh, if you're talking to the public, um, you want to present it in a way that is friendly. 
it's kind I was going to add to that that um, when the United States unfortunately pulled out of the Par Paris Climate Treaty, uh, many cities and states around the country um, decided they would still uh, remain in and try to do the things that the nation as a whole should be doing in small communities. And I spoke to my city council, and when you get up there and you say, as a nurse or as a doctor, I think that people do listen to you. And not to say that they wouldn't listen, you know, as an owner of a small business, you know, there, everybody has a voice in this, but I do think there is some clout. And, and so that's something else I would bring up is that be given where we're at um, on the federal level, we need to be doing a lot more with our local governments. Um, you know, you guys convinced a Republican, that's awesome. Many of us um, sing to the choir in our, in our towns, I know that I do, but um, um, looking at what changes we can make as professionals in our um, communities, in our counties, in our states um, is huge. Yeah. I think another uh, subject that's really good to get into medical education and the residency programs, and I know they're starting to do it more in pediatrics, but it's not a requirement, is teaching advocacy. Um, so you might not be able to get in climate change, but you might be able to get in advocacy. And I'm wondering, Brittany, do you know if there's been any movement to convince programs to do that, or another one of you? To, to do advocacy? It, to teach, yeah, to give, yeah, to teach either students or residents or nursing students, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah, advocacy. that's a good question. Um, I was just thinking about that as we were talking about this because it's, it is a question that we talk about um, with the consortium, uh, with our coordinating committee, whether um, we should be talking about adv advocacy or just focusing on education. Um, some, some people think that we should be advo more advocates and others think that we shouldn't be um, pushing so strongly for that. We should just provide the science and the knowledge for them to then take that and um, advocate on their own or get involved in activism. Um, so that's a good question. It is something that, um, getting back to the core competencies, we do have one of the core competencies is around uh, political issues and knowing how to work with um, pe your peers and um, working across disciplines and mm -hmm. the community and knowing what the health professional can do and what the limitations are. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as physicians, we are all, and nurses, we're all natural advocates, right? We advocate for our patients every single day to get them, you know, the medications they need on time and get them where they need to be. And so I think we sort of have this natural knack at, at advocating for our patients. And so one question I have is, you know, similar to how, you know, when medical students step up and say, we want this education, I mean, do patients want this education? And um, how much do we think that patients want their doctors to be talking to them about climate change? And uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, does anybody here talk to their patients about climate change? Yeah, we got some hands up. Can you share a little bit about how those conversations go? Oh, can we get a mic? Oh, look, we're going to bring you a mic. Awesome. Yeah. And that seems totally natural. So I work, in, I work in New York City. Many of my patients are first responders from Staten Island. I work for the World Trade Center Health Program. And um, Staten Island was heavily hit by Sandy. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but um, it's been very interesting. <laughs> and a few, a few are starting to express the hint of, whoa. <laughs> And um, I'm very careful. I am very careful. <laughs> but I do slip in things, especially the patients who have respiratory diseases, about worsening climate, health, heat, and um, climate change. And then I just act dumb and um, say nothing more. But mm -hmm. I'm, I've been, fewer are really holding on tight. But little by little, I'm hearing twinges. <laughs> Uh, in the front row, I'm, Dr. Helton. I'm pretty loud. So on this question, which I think is so important, maybe if, if it's framed in the spirit of activism, not necessarily advocacy, but the tradition of taking scientific evidence, the evidence base, translating it, and sharing it with our patients, the people we work with, even our colleagues and the public. I mean, to me, that hopefully is, is a bit depoliticized evidence, science, 
putting it into action, sharing that knowledge, that it seems like might be a safer foundation on which to stand. But I don't know. It seems like that's that's where we're at. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, if it's one of those bad air quality days and I'm in the pediatric emergency room, you know, patients come in and, and families are obviously like, very concerned. And I sort of say something like, well, you know, we've been seeing a lot of this the past couple of days. And it kind of spurs that kind of like, oh, there's a bigger thing going on here. It's not just me and my kid. It's like a lot of kids are having this. And it starts, I think, getting people's heads sort of up, looking around at bigger problems um, when they feel like they're not so alone. Then we have another question back or comment. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, and I just want to, uh, Insay Witherspoon with the Children's Environmental Health Network, um, just want to piggyback off of Kim and some other great points. Just a couple reminders, and I'm sure we all know this, but the incredible power of coordination and collaboration, regardless of what audience you're talking about. So we've been part of a lot of messaging in public health and environmental health lately. It should not be surprising that what resonates as far as one of the top most respected and trusted people in our community are the healthcare professionals. Sure. Um, if folks are so lucky to have a connection with a healthcare professional. So that totally needs to be <laughs> taken advantage of. Now, when you combine that with the power of youth and youth that can speak for themselves and or very touchy, you know, emotionally driven stories of personal stories and uh, you know, maybe, maybe a public health advocate group that can go the extra mile, right, and take it a little further than maybe someone's comfortable with on the health professional side or trained. Um, we do this all the time with Annie and uh, American Lung and NRDC, and I mean, many of us do this all the time, but we know that that's not necessarily the common ground for many healthcare professionals. So the ideal, I think, sweet spot is if we can continue to build the education as we're doing among the constituents that you all know best, but then also take it one step further in the, at the community level and certainly to the national and regional level as, as well, whether it's the Rotary Club or whoever, but take the combined impacts. And as far as engagement, I would also offer that one indicator is which me the messenger is extremely important or messengers, but also how, in what way are we uh, organizing that content? So I would respectfully just edit your last comment on okay. the slide on the climate lobby. I would just add, and, I, and you're already implementing this, but the power of utilizing um, children and the next generation. So mm -hmm. while I would agree you want to personalize it to whoever you're talking to, but everyone's connected to a child some way, shape, or form, and they usually want the next generation, grandparents, kids down the street, to be better off. So Absolutely. as much as we can drive that home, it's very hard for the average you know, human to not have a connector. And once you have an emo emotional connector, mm -hmm. you already have an entryway. Um, and, that point. and I would, you know, I would, in terms of um, working with our representative, he, we had met with him several times prior to the students um, asking him that. And I had a feeling he might say yes when they asked. And part of the reason is when we asked him why did he choose to run, he said he, it was to make the world better for his grandkids. So we turned around and gave him the same demographics. Not, I mean, it wasn't that calculated. The kids wanted to do it, and it just so happened they, that, that it was the uh, same demographics. But I think that's why it was so effective, that connection. You know, of course we all want something good for our, the next generation, and he had expressed it. I just want to oh. say one quick, sorry. I, um, just a, a phrase by Alistair, attributed to Alistair Woodward, who um, was a health um, lead on the IPCC. He said that the, the, a lot of the climate models go to 2100. That's where we see the really bad ones, you know, our RCP 8.5s and so forth. He said the 2100 generation is already here, mm -hmm. right? Those mm -hmm. people will be 82 years old. This is not science fiction anymore. Mm -hmm. It's real. I thought that, he said that in an audience. It was very powerful. Yeah, it's kind of Some of us in the room are old enough to remember when patients got really mad when you suggested that smoking affected their health. <laughs> it took a few years, and now you know, virtually no patient gets mad at you. For, they, they might not want to quit, but they don't get mad at you. So. Uh, question in the front here. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Hi, I'm, my name is Kate Perry. I'm with the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, and one thing that we hear over and over again is that there's so many competing priorities within the office, right? So while a lot of our physicians want to talk to their patients about this, they have a litany of other things that they need to address in this acute sense. Um, and so one thing we're kind of considering is how we can integrate this conversation into team-based care and how we can utilize the whole medical staff in creating this conversation um, while also keeping it patient-centered, right? There's a lot of things that are not going to be realistic for someone in LA to move out of the middle of LA to fix their asthma. And so 
that just what we hear from a lot, a lot from our members is we're already doing so much and it's so hard to continue to integrate this. And so somehow how we can create these sound bites, right? So you're still getting that impact from your physician, from your healthcare provider about the importance of climate change and then it being reinforced by the rest of the team um, could be really impactful. And then a second point is that how we engage our members who are not in med school, right, who have been practicing for 20 or 30 years, and we take this huge topic and boil it down into a one-hour webinar on CME, right, or some information on our website that they're going to spend 10 minutes at most looking over, and so how it's, how me as an educator with a public health background can pick the most important things that our members might take to their staff or, and, and to their patients, um, is kind of where we're at now, and I think kind of identifying those priorities would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks uh, so I'm going to answer your first part, and I think Caroline maybe can answer the second part with the AAFP members. But the first part in terms of team-based care, I think that's a really important point. And I always tell my students, none of us can, can do this in the four walls of an exam room, and we need our interpreter and our social worker and our IT people on board. And so I think when you said, you know, how who's on the, the team-based care piece, I think that one of the things that I know we're missing, and I practice clinically in a federally, federally qualified health center, is data. So if I know that six of my kids have been um, seen in an ED over a month for, for, um, for asthma, um, I want to know, well, what was the temperature that day, and can we pull some data from that? Um, I think a huge one, which is a little off the topic of, of climate change, but certainly fits in with environmental health, is lead. So if I have two or three kids with elevated lead level, who else lives in that zip code, in that apartment building, in buildings owned by that same landlord who hasn't dealt with this, and or have all those kids had their appropriate lead testing? And so I think when we look at the team for this, we have to really utilize our, the, the population data in our electronic health record and and bring those folks into the fold, and they're not the people who are gonna be at this meeting, they're not the people who are gonna be doing CEs on climate change, they're the, the computer nerds, for lack of a better word, who are you know sitting in some office, and they don't know what data we want, and maybe we don't know what data we want either, but I think the more we figure out what we can pull out of that, um, and include the IT people in team-based care is huge. And then the second piece of that as part of the team is the community health worker who may live in that neighborhood, speak the language, understand um, some of the issues. You know, if, if we say, gee, you shouldn't put your kids outside because it's a red, a code red day for asthma, and the mother's like, well, great, am I going to stay home from work all day? My kids have to go to summer camp because I have to go to work. You know, how do we deal with those kind of things? And we in this room may not have those answers, but some people from the community may have some, some better ideas. So mm -hmm. encouraging people who are from the community to be involved um, in that team, including our community health workers, I think is huge and part of that. Mm -hmm. Great. Mothers, oh. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And mothers were instrumental in getting the Clean Air Act passed, and I've been impressed by Molly Rauch's work, the um, uh, Clean Air Force, where she, has, she talks to mothers and asks them to go to their physicians' offices and ask them to teach them about climate change. So it's kind of working backwards rather than having physicians present information to their patients. Patients <laughs> demand, you know, it's just like the... Um, the pharmaceutical companies say, ask your doctor. Well, <laughs> we need advertisements about ask your doctor about climate change. <laughs> um, but the other thing is um, we can learn from the uh, CDC's antibiotic campaigns, and they had a multi-pronged approach, including posters in the waiting room and brochures, things that don't take up time. Uh, combining that with a team-based approach, um, could be an effective sort of at least eyebrow raiser for patients. Okay. Thanks. A question here? Yeah, Peter Joseph with Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, I want to thank the panel. It's been really very, very interesting. And I want to refer to something that Jay said just a moment ago about how the uh, ASAP, the American College of Emergency Physicians, refuses to take on this issue. And they're not alone, of course. I'm in the UR doc, so I've been a long term member of ASAP and ACP. <coughs> I, I want to focus on an area where I think physicians do have expertise that hasn't been discussed, and that is the issue of denial, and it's the issue of grief. We often have to be the deliverers of horrible news to people. Uh, we sit with families in their grief, and I doubt that there's a person in this room 
who has not experienced some degree of grief over what has happened uh, with the climate, what we have lost already, and what we are going to lose no matter what we do. And there's a lot of, um, I've heard it in this audience, uh, it's pretty depressing. And as doctors, we know how to deal with that and comfort people, including ourselves. So I would like to interject that into the conversation that this is an area where doctors can also be helpful in working with the general state of denial in our civilization about where we are, where we're going, and what we have to do. Um, it's kind of a survival mechanism to not really want to think about how bad it is, how bad it's going to be. And that's to some degree healthy. But we can help our colleagues, our organizations, our friends, family, and patients deal with this. And the best antidote to despair that I know of is action. It makes you feel better. It's like exercise. And mm -hmm. getting people active and involved and doing something about this problem also helps them admit that we have this problem. So to echo a comment that was made three or four comments ago, we must be specific. And that's what I'm going to be talking about at 8 o'clock tomorrow, is to how can we be specific as doctors in terms of what we need to do to mitigate this problem. Thank you so much. Um, I've got a question sort of for everyone. We've got about five minutes left, and we're here with you know, the, the medical societies. And we've talked a lot about how to bring climate change to educational curriculums, to medical schools, to residency programs. And I want to kind of get people's thoughts on how do we bring better education to practicing physicians, people who have been in practice for 20, 30 years. How do, we, how do we use our societies, use these channels of communication to get education um, to practicing physicians who are somewhat disconnected from, from you know, the academic reality that we're embedded in here? Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Julie Graves, Georgetown Family Medicine. Um, so I'm going to get to that one. but. I want to go back to the advocacy education. Sure. Um, one place in a previous position that I found for that was in the ethics curriculum mm -hmm. under the concept mm -hmm. of beneficence and also professional responsibility and mm -hmm. was able to put in um, some, but, you know, I found that medical students, because we don't require them to take government classes as a prerequisite for medical <laughs> school, would come and not know the difference between a federal and a state legislator. Mm -hmm. And I would make them watch Schoolhouse Rock, how a bill becomes a law, and things like that. But, you know, it is a place in the curriculum, ethics as a competency yeah. that includes advocacy, and it also may include, in, especially in the beneficence, um, climate education. Um, I really love your question about what to do about the practicing physician. Um, and I think about that in almost everything we think about when we want to bring new knowledge to the practicing physician. And I've worn that hat too, I've been in, a, in private practice. I know what I needed and I know what constituents in medical society say is they need tools. They can, you know, we can tell them what all day, but when you're working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, mm -hmm. what you need is a tool. So, you know, I was at an immunization coalition meeting last week and we thought about how to put billing codes and proper, here's how not to commit fraud when you bill for vaccines. Right. So when we think about what we want them to know, we need to give a tool. Well, here's a widget that can go on your web website and here is how to put it in. Uh -huh. You know, here are the codes you could use if you're gonna to talk to a patient about this. I think in addition to content, we've gotta talk about tools and how to. Yeah, great, great. Uh, right up in front, yes. Oh, sorry, did I skip somebody? Go ahead. Uh Yes, um, so uh, kind of dovetailing off um, the former speaker was saying, um, w thinking about a tools and where would a tool come from, and in this whole time I've been thinking about how um, one of the things that I've seen is that climate change has been sort of um, integrated into, or at least attempted to be, or there's an effort to integrate it into the education, but I'm thinking if climate change um, is the greatest threat, then what if we have that as a central focus and then we tie everything else to that, right? If, if, if that's our central, if that's, our, if that's central, 
if it's a central threat, if it's an existential threat, and if we tie the education, then it comes back to tools will come out of changes in education that would allow for um, to be integrated for um, practitioners in already um, in the field. And I think that it would extend from there. So maybe it's just a paradigm shift of um, rather than integrating it, it's, it's, it's making it central and then tying everything else to it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm with, I'm Dr. Holder, I'm with the Florida State Medical Association, one of the presidents of the nine local societies. With the National Medical Association, what we've started doing is we've made it the primary focus at what's called a colloquium, which was just earlier this year, where we bring all the local chapter presidents and regional folks together, and we did a whole thing on climate change. Our state meeting this year was on climate and health disparity. And with that, we now work with our local society presidents to then spread the message among our locals and the different groups. We're not large, because we have nine local in Florida, but there might be about four or 500 black physicians in the state if we're, and in terms of activity. So it's a small group, but that's the structure that we've started, that the national made it a priority, mm -hmm. then we took it to the region, and then we're taking it to the presidents of all the state local societies, and we're spreading it through. It's easier for me in Florida because we see the effect, mm -hmm. and the yeah. movements and what's happening with our patients and our numbers and the concerns and the cost impact, not just on the patients, but on the physicians. Every time you have to prepare for a storm, you don't bill, it's real. Yeah. So we're getting a lot more uptake with our population because you know, I always say the black patients and the black docs are often like the canary in a coal mine. Mm -hmm. So when it's happening, mm -hmm. when we lose patients and the changes in the migration shift of populations being moved from high high ground, they're shifting out to low ground, and your office is in this area that had the largest black community that's now dispersed throughout the county. Do you just pick up your practice and leave? Wow. Um, so these are some major issues that are impacting the physicians that I work with as in the black population. So that's, we are calling the alarm. So it may not be as urgent for other communities, but for right now, Florida and the black community, it's really beginning to hurt. Thanks for sharing. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, yeah, right here. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo what Dr. Colder said, that our county medical societies, our professional organizations, our state medical societies are thirsty for articles for their monthly journals, for their annual meetings, CME programs. So offer those talks and, and articles, and they'll be accepted. And I'd echo that tomorrow morning's 930 program in this room is on this topic. How do we reach professionals in practice? So stand by. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, right here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, know there's not enough time to talk about this, um, but um, it was mentioned, I think Dr. Lemery mentioned just briefly something about K through 12 climate education, and then he went on to something else. But, you know, we, we recently saw how important, um, you know, the, the youth could be in starting a national movement, like with the gun, mm -hmm. you know, tragedy that happened in Florida a couple of weeks ago. Um, I know that the Heartland Institute is subsidizing, you know, advocacy for curriculum teaching about, you know, confusing the climate issue mm -hmm. um, in, in, in K through 12 education. And I'd just like to know how we could, we could interface with that and what we can do about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Any of the panelists want to take that? Jay? Stacey, could I address that? Yeah. Yeah, John. go ahead, sir. Um, so from a standpoint of, there is a very large effort on climate literacy and in the process of STEM education. Um, I don't know that that's foundation funding. There's some federal funding. There's a, you know, the Clean Network. There are a lot of different networks that are doing this. Um, what's been absent from that a little bit has been the health side of climate change um, and using health as an integrator for students to be able to understand complex systems thinking and the kind of eco ecological learning that they need to understand climate change in a high school curriculum. Um, and we've been doing some of that at NIEHS, um, and I'll be mentioning it in about 40 minutes, but it's not, well, I mean, this is, it's a, it's a great question, and I think that, um, there, you know, it's there, but it could use, again, a little bit more oomph behind it. Okay, thanks, so uh, we are just out of time right now. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists, I thank everyone for being here today and contributing, this has been so wonderful.